Selena? Yeah. Did you do it? Yeah. Okay, now do the number two. I'm making her write the number five and number two 50 times each because she keeps writing them backwards. Which normally I would just kind of work with her on casually. But yesterday she gave my wife hell, her mother, a real run for her money, a lot of this. So today she's having a rough day. Forgive her. But if you're going to have a chip on your shoulder around here, you better have all your stuff together. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Sit Down Saturday. Today, we're going to finally get to the third part of this, which is Toy World. We've been talking about it for some time. We haven't had the chance to do it. We did the past, present, and future on Zeta. We did the Zeta versus Toy World. Now we get to do the Toy World, and another trilogy is complete. I've been chomping at the bit to try to get this one done for so long, but because of circumstances beyond my control and beyond our control, we've had to take some diversions in order to get here. But we're here, so let's enjoy it. But in order to enjoy it, we first have to do some house cleaning. Last week, sit down Saturday on Earthrise, a lot of people mentioned in the comments that there was too many plot threads, and I agree. It's something that I meant to bring up. I'm not sure if I did or didn't. I'm guessing I didn't from the amount of comments it was, but I do agree with you 100%, and it was in my notes. I just must have skipped over it. There were too many plot threads, and some were almost, it seemed like, abandoned, specifically that of the Quintesson springs to mind. So yes, I agree with you there as well. Then we have the DX9 Minosaur. I was flooded with people sending me videos and pictures and comments comments and everything else. Thank you, thank you, thank you on how to install that gray piece to keep breakdown uh, tight. I'm going to do a video on that and show it at some point. I just have to find the time. It's, it's going to set me back a bit, but I'll, I'll work it out and get it up. Supposedly, it works like a champ. I can attest to it because I haven't done it quite yet. I might even do it today. I might have done it already. Who knows? Uh, there was a number of people that seemed to think that it was terrible, and it seemed like a lot of those people weren't buying it anyway. This often happens when we look at third-party stuff and people start to have this confirmation by when there are competitors, especially when they have bought the uh, the competition. I've noticed it more and more and more, but it's always obnoxious to me. But like, if you don't have this and you think it's trash and you have something else and you think it's great, just take a minute and, and reflect on that for a bit. Is it possible that you're just rolling the dice on sixes every time? Or is it possible that you have a bit of confirmation bias? And either is okay. It's just 2021, time to do some reflection. Time to work on us a bit. You know what I mean? It's not terrible at all. It's great. The breakdown thing is a bummer, but apparently they included an adapter that works, we'll know shortly. I wish there was some more paint on the legs. I wish the car is attached in the front, but that's not DX9's fault. That's the cartoon's fault. And, and then there was drag strip, uh, which looks great. A lot of people were talking about the, the legs. The knee proportion does look a little wonky. It, look, it's subjective, right? There's certain things that bother me more about proportions than others. To me, I always want the Transformers to look bigger than what they are. I could do a whole video on this, but I'm not sure anybody would be that interested. As a result, those proportions do count. But longer lower legs, shorter upper legs, shorter arms and it gives you the illusion that you're looking up at it. It does look strange when you bend the knee, I agree, uh, but not nearly as strange as the hands, for instance. Somebody said, well, what about the, the you know, the MMC? You, you don't have a problem with that? Or you have a problem with that? You don't have a problem with this? Like, yeah. To, and, and to me, one looks grossly worse than the other. That's subjective. That's a matter of opinion and preference. But yes. But yeah, that drag show is pretty strong. Another guy was talking about how the head is visible, and it is, and it's always going to be visible, but you can turn it 180 so that the face is covered. So, I don't know. That's not a big deal to me. Once again, it's, it's I would have guessed which one do you have and which one are you getting? and are we looking for reasons to, you know, confirm our bias? I'm not saying you are, just saying, ask yourself. I had to do it to myself as well. It's bit me in a matter of fact, a couple times. And I think that's it. So let's talk about Toy World. And this, we're going to go through all of their figures as usual. There's one thing that I want to say before we get into that. And that is, I'm not sure how, if you guys remember how many guys you've been around for the, the block a few times, as it were. The old school guys, you know what I mean, that have been in this thing since 2014, 15 or so, will recall. When everybody was trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together and who's who and what company's what and who's working for who and who's designing what and, you know, all that kind of stuff. One of the things that came out early, and, and forgive me, I have it either one way or the other. Like, it's, it's, I'm either right or I'm backward. But when you contacted iGear's customer support, the Toy World email would pop up. Or if you contacted Toy World's customer support, the iGear email would pop up. But I think I'm right in saying that the Toy World email would pop up and that those companies were related. There was a lot of rumors circulating at the time that Toy World had a fair amount of clout in the game, perhaps even access to advantages beyond what many companies had at the time. I don't know too much about that, but what I do know is that, you know, recently we've heard 
heard rumors of them being raided, which we will get to at the end. But first, we have to go through their entire history. And in order to do so, we have to go back in time. And Toy World's history almost pretty much starts around the same time as mine. Now, not necessarily their reveals and stuff, but their releases. So when I started getting into third party around 2014, I believe their Hegemon was already available. This was their Megatron figure that was chug scaled because at the time there weren't many great options available for a Megatron in a G1 aesthetic. And Hegemon checked that box in a big way. It was praised for years. In fact, it took Hasbro a long time to come up with something that was even remotely competing in that arena. It had a reputation for having a real pain and bear of a transformation. I can't speak on it. I never handled it, but I was aware of its reputation when I started getting into third party, but it was definitely a major impact. Now, the second release of theirs, I believe anyway, was Grind Rod, and this I did pick up. This was their first Throttlebot attempt, and although it didn't seem quite like a masterpiece, it did feel close. Now, the masterpiece aesthetic at the time was a bit more forgiving in regard to the cartoon aesthetic so there was more wiggle room to be had from a third party company but it felt close enough i was definitely impressed with it as a release and being one of my first dealings with the company now i will say this one of the cool things about this release was shortly after it came out pictures started surfacing of fans who had found what they thought was a combined mode of grind rod forming the lower leg and i do feel like every time i say grind rod i should so to speak it but we're just gonna let it go as a, a heads up a lot of their names early on caused a lot of jokes amongst my immature friends myself included but this rumor did start to catch on about grind rod having a combined mode and that perhaps all of the throttle bots would be able to play apart or perhaps it was a lucky find from a fan once again kind of lending itself to the excitement of third party at the time now the next batch of releases became a bit more prolific we got aurora which was their take on searchlight as well as trace which was their take on chase two more throttle bots and two more figures that seemingly had modes that lent themselves to the possibility of a combiner so the rumor only caught steam and momentum both were built to pretty much the same caliber with perhaps trace being the weaker link for those that remember those side mirrors just would not stay in place but they didn't stop there in fact they had a whole nother line that was headmasters and while they still seemed a bit chuggish they were competing with fans project who was the major third-party contender at the time but they seemed like they were going for different scales the fans project were smaller and definitely seemed more chug oriented while the toy worlds were larger and although aesthetically fit in more with the chug design especially brainstorm's face which looked pretty crazy size wise fit pretty well with mps at the time and they released brainstorm which was called brainwave and hardhead uh, as they titled him oh boy hardbone that's right grind rod and hardbone inside of 365 days i believe neither here nor there i will say that the plastic quality for brainwave and hardbone seemed to be a bit less however the fun was there and the sort of general build quality and sculpt was there and it's hard to kind of believe now but they were competing with fans project who was like the fans toys of their time they weren't a joke i think that objectively the fans project offering was better but this was a contender now they also released a companion piece to their hegemon which was orion their take on optimus prime which was much more idw inspired but once again had a great reputation a great sculpt a great aesthetic and for years was the best available and perhaps only available idw kind of milne inspired optimus Optimus Prime. This is before the era of Generation Toy and G Creations, and it was really well renowned. They continued on with even more releases. However, they weren't as prolific with getting the rest of their throttle bots out, which did cause some concern. But we did get a B, which was their take on Bumblebee, and for years, much like Hegemon, fit in as a G1 aesthetic, and also many people were using him as a masterpiece. In fact, I know that as of today, some people are still using him as a masterpiece because while he's not perfect, no masterpiece offer really has been. I never had the opportunity to look at him, but he was fairly well regarded. We also got their Grand Maximus, which was their grant, which was originally a TF Source exclusive at a TF Con, if memory serves. There was a bit of drama and controversy surrounding this release and its exclusivity, but like much of this stuff, the controversy quickly faded. Later on, they did a Fortress Maximus version as well. They also continued on with their Headmaster series, doing Swamper, which was their take on Skullcruncher. By this time, I had 
quit buying their headmasters because while the size was better than the fans project offerings, it wasn't quite right enough for me. And the general feeling regarding their headmasters was that they just weren't competing in the same way. This was during the era of what we called the chugster piece when a lot of third party companies were trying to create pieces that masterpiece collectors and chug collectors would be interested in doubling the pot as it were of people that would potentially buy their product. And around this time, I think fans also became, became a bit more savvy as to which pieces they were going to pick up while choosing for their collection specifically and appropriately. But it was a decent figure. They also released their first Dinobot. They did a whole set of Dinobots during the era when everybody did Dinobots, including Fans Project, G Creations, Fans Toys, etc. And theirs were kind of chug styled and were decent figures, but added in the gimmick of combining. And while all of them were kind of decent, the combine mode wasn't really successful, but we did get all of them and in a decent amount of time. And they fit really well, once again, in that same vein of providing something with a relatively accurate G1 aesthetic to the Chug Collector. Something that was really not happening at the time, which I know seems crazy by what's going on with today with Earthrise and Siege and all that kind of stuff. But back then, it seemed impossible. But they released all five, and they did combine. And ironically, I think it's one of my highest viewed videos. But it's far from the greatest thing in the world. In fact, if you're looking for a combined Dinobot thing... I would only choose it over the Hasbro offering. Moving into kind of their next batch of figures, they did repaints, of course, along the way of a lot of these figures as well, including a blue Bumblebee and Black Prime and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to kind of stay outside of that. They did do an Astrotrain. Now, they released this around the same time as the DX9 offering, which was just a better piece all around, kind of. And many people debate me on that. But this figure only really picked up in popularity once it started getting clearanced out at stores for people not buying it in the first place. It was an interesting enough offering and worked really well for a chug, but it just just didn't have the aesthetic. You got to also take into account that around this time, the masterpiece aesthetic is changing. The bar is raising that the standards are going up and Toy World's still kind of playing the middle of the field, not really keeping up, which becomes a big part of their undoing. But let's continue. They did finally finish their Throttlebot set, which was Highway, their take on Freeway, Shinebug, their take on Goldbug, and Sideload, their take on Wideload. And in hindsight, looking at this, it's really quite fascinating because this is when they introduced the idea of heavy parts forming. And this combiner was probably the most stable combiner of its day. However, it wasn't regarded as well because it was kind of an homage to the GoBot combiner and kind of just nothing or hadn't had no homage. So I think people were kind of on the fence as to how they felt about it. But objectively, the build quality of this thing was far more advanced than what we had seen in the past. But it only held the crown for a limited amount of time because what came after this was their take on the Constructicons. And the Constructicon offering that they did is still to date the most stable masterpiece scaled Constructicon set ever and arguably the only masterpiece scaled Constructicon set ever. But it was just a tremendous offering and had heavy parts for but changed the scape and changed the culture and changed the way the combiners were looked at that we're still seeing even as of this past week in reviews. It will always be the mark that they left on third-party history. After this... Their design team became Zeta, and they split. And this is when they start to get kind of fuzzy. We got a number of offerings at an attempt at a Studio Ox-styled MP offerings. This is them making a very conscious attempt to keep up with the climate, which is heavy on MP at the time. This is before the Legends wave. Make Toys is doing MP. Fans Toys is obviously doing MP. XTB is doing MP. KFC is doing MP. Everybody's getting into MP. And this was them making an effort to get involved, but have their own lane. And the lane they chose was Studio Ox. And as a result of this, we got a Sea Spray, a Cosmos, a Springer, an RC, and a cup. I never looked at the cup. The Cosmos might be subjectively my favorite of the MP Cosmoses that were offered. The Sea Spray was kind of a miss because it was going up against X Transbots and Fans Toys at the time. The Springer, unfortunately, was also competing with a number of offerings, but from MMC, X Transbots, Fans Toys, etc. So it just, Unique Toys as well, it just couldn't fight with those. And the same kind of goes for their cup, which is probably their worst competitive offering to date. And let's not forget the Jazz, which in contrast to their cup was probably their best offering within the line. 
that is to say, of the MPs with the Studio Ox styling. It was a competitor. It's still considered a competitor. I believe these are also the designs that Zeta feels as though they weren't fully paid for. They carried on a bit more with this and luckily were able to complete a set of cone heads which were good figures, by the way, all three of them. Obviously, it's the same mold, but there are some differences with the wings and such. But they were solid offerings. I did have the opportunity to look at one of those, I believe the Dirge. And after that is when they started to feel like the girlfriend that lost her mind after the breakup. That breakup being between them and Zeta. There is one other figure that kind of got in through the cracks here. And to be fair, this was around the time when I was contacted by someone related to them. And they sent me their masterpiece scaled Optimus Prime, which was solid and interesting and a good looking figure. I reviewed it and I gave it to Joe because Joe was interested in it. And that's my friend. Joe's my friend. He's a cool guy. I'm sorry. I'm sleep deprived. But it was after this that they just spun out of control. And this is when we started to get a lot of strange releases. In no particular order, we got a lot of movie stuff, including a movie B, a movie Prime, a barricade, along with other characters who I don't even know their name and these kind of original takes on these World War I or World War II type characters. I didn't quite understand any of this stuff. It seemed like such a strange move, but I guess because of the success and at least frequency of the films, they thought it was a good idea. And maybe it was, but it doesn't necessarily appear to be. Then we got Legends figures out of the blue, I guess once again with them trying to keep up with the wave. We got a Beast Wars Megatron, which is one of the worst figures I've looked at in recent years. And we also got a Wheel Jack that they also did a repaint of as Exhaust. However, I didn't look at either one of those, I don't believe, so I don't feel confident or fair to judge them. And the last major contribution that we heard about them was that they were doing a Predaking. They teased us with art, and then we get information that they basically handed it off to Kang Toys. For more information on that, check out my video on that subject specifically. Brings us to today. And that brings us to our current state. So it also simultaneously brings us to some current drama. And I say current, it's relatively current because this is a little bit delayed because we had other stuff that kind of popped up and took precedence. So the Facebook page trans fans published a post that said a well-known 3P been raided by police. Stay tuned for more information. Shortly after that, we got word, hello, I have contacted the local seller whom closely ordered 3P company in our country. We have confirmed that it is indeed Toy World. At the moment, only Optimus Prime in the 3D design have been confiscated, though no official news which Optimus Prime it is. They are currently monitoring as the factory and personnel in charge have been detained. So it looks like that might be the bitter end for Toy World. And if you ask me what is at the root of it, it is dealing with this movie stuff. There was rumor that 3A had displayed an Optimus Prime in some sort of kind of official manner and side by side Toy World had displayed their Optimus Prime and that might have brought some heat on them. Look, I know that the movie stuff is viable, especially because you can do that Prime, right? Everybody's jumping at a chance to do more Primes. It's how this thing goes. It also yields the possibility now to do a Seeker and to do Shockwave and to do Soundwave and to do all of the kind of classics, right? So you're gonna get them. My advice is this, stay away. That movie stuff is big business. It's big money. It's big licensing, big franchising, big marketing, big distributing. It's big business. Masterpiece Transformers or not. Chug Transformers or not. In comparison, leave that movie stuff alone. 3P, I urge you, leave it alone. They're not playing, not with that. But I digress. So that might be the end of them. That might be where they leave off on. And it's unfortunate because it's a sour foot to leave off on for a company that has done some pretty major things throughout its career. Let's talk about it briefly for a bit. I'll tell you what they did that was smart and ultimately became part of their undoing. Early on, they diversified. They did major characters like Optimus and Megatron. They did obscure characters like the Throttlebots. Simultaneously, they were working with the headmasters and they all kind of fit and satisfied different scales and ranges. They continued this trend and as a result, we're setting trends. 
and that's part of the reason that makes them special. They were trendsetters. They implemented parts forming technology to make combiners stable. They took risky ideas and takes on combiners, some of which I liked, some of which I didn't, but it doesn't change the fact that they did it. Then the masterpiece wave hit and they followed suit. But even in there, even in that lane, they found ways to innovate. They found ways to be unique. They found ways to be original and they found ways to diversify. And then once the Zeta thing happened, they fell apart. There was no common threads anymore. There was still plenty of diversity, but it didn't make sense and it started to seem random. There was movie stuff, both from the Bayverse and from the Bumblebee movie. There was Masterpiece stuff. There were Legends stuff. Then there was Legends Beast Wars stuff. Then there's this World War II stuff that doesn't really fit. It, like, it all started to get random. I know anytime that we talk about this stuff, there's always that, that group of people that are like, man, I really wanted that World War II stuff. I, that was the stuff I was really looking forward to. And look, I sympathize with you, and I'll tell you why. I really want Terracons. I really want the clones. I really want obscure characters. And it doesn't look great that I'm going to get them. So if I'm not going to get the obscure characters that actually do have a place in this, the chances of this company dumping tons of money into characters that have no place whatsoever in being successful is not great. They wrote a blueprint that made them very successful. And then they took that blueprint and they folded it into squares and they placed it in the fireplace. And what was left was just the ashes that they took the most rounded edges of in order to make a new one. And it didn't work. And it wasn't working. And they started to unravel. I love this company. I think that they're great. I think they have a great legacy. I think they've done some things that have changed change third party forever. I just looked at a Minasaur that is only successful because of what Toy World did. Without Constructor, that Minasaur theoretically is not successful. And guess what? The x bots is going to be the same way if it's successful. So I wish them the best, but I'm not sure what's going to shake out from all of that. Third party companies, leave that movie stuff alone. Leave it alone. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. Finally got it done. Outstanding. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Until next time, take care.